Hi, I'm Amy Coots, and I'm an actor, hypnotherapist, and the founder of Acting with Courage Hypnotherapy. And in this series, I will be interviewing some fantastic actors, writers, directors, producers, anyone involved in the creative arts, and I will be asking them how and why they got into their respective careers and the advice that they offer to other creatives to look after their mental health and well-being. Hello and welcome to this episode of Why This? My guest today is actor and founder of UK Actors Support Network, John Craggs. Originally hailing from Yorkshire, John trained at the Birmingham School of Speech and Drama and has since gone on to work in London, the US and Germany in professional theatre, commercials, film, TV and voiceover. John is possibly most well known for his Twitter presence on his UK Actors Support Network page, in which he supports fellow actors, producers and casting directors with motivation and well-being. He shares audition notices, arts news and networking opportunities. Most recently, John has been hosting rehearsed readings for actors, which in turn have raised funds for Acting With Others charity. Hello, John Craggs. Thank you so Hello. much for joining me. How are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. And yourself? I'm well, I'm well, all things considered. All good. good. <laughs> Still good. smiling. <laughs> you know what? Let's just let's just get straight to it, shall we? So mm -hmm. you run, I guess it's like a, a Twitter support group of, of sorts called Support British. Tell me it why. Is, yes. it's, a, it's a platform for everybody in the industry. Um, if I can if I may, I'll take you back to sort of 2018. Um, and I've been on Twitter since 2012, because you're seeing lots and lots of people, whether they be industry, whoever they are, actors coming forward, uh, people sort of saying they're running workshops, et cetera, et cetera. And I was looking at all of this and thinking, well, none of it seems to be in concentrated area, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. why not? Let's see if we can create something. And, and um put something together so that everyone can collaborate with each other. And that, in, in, in a nutshell, is basically what happened in, in October 2018. And it's grown from strength to strength. Right. And I've seen the number of followers has grown to, what is it, like somewhere but somewhere up to 20,000? 20,000. 20, hit just over 900, 20,900. I think that was yesterday. Wow. That is phenomenal. So... so Talk me through a little more about the intricacies of what you offer or what people can find if they come to support British. If they jump on there, they're going to find that they can post their own stuff. So, if, for example, if they're producing a show, if they're looking for an agent, they want to collaborate with people on things, they want to have a basic <laughs> moan and groan about something, you know, within reason. It's there for them to do. And I'm quite happy then to either retweet uh, I try to, I try my best uh, to remain as impartial as I possibly can, but with being an actor myself uh, and running this account um, single-handedly, uh, sometimes I will see things and I think, well, that really needs, I think it needs to be taken away from the main, main page and taken to private messages. But um, I digress. The essential thing about Support British is for people to, communicate with each other to collaborate mm. um and to basically care for other people in in for the want of better terminology so that everybody is together um and if somebody's having a problem especially as we're going through lockdown uh, in lockdown for the third time um it's a horrible time a challenging time for everyone but i do think that it's important that we communicate and that is one of the essentials of the account and the account is open to anyone, preferably people that are in the industry. But obviously, we do have people that are interested in, you know, that follow theatre, that support theatre, because at the end of the day, it's down to we only get work uh, and we're only in jobs when the jobs are uh, available. And it's down to the public that we're able to work because of the of the public. And, and, mm -hmm. and that's what it's there for. Uh, so uh, to me, I see it as just a hub, a platform for anyone that's in the industry and no one needs to feel as if they are isolated or if they're on their own in any shape or form. It's there for everyone. Um, I'm a great advocate for supporting people, for caring about people as a, a fellow actor. And if I may say so, this this stems, we always say it comes from, from family. And in this case, 
Um, it does come from family. It comes from my mother that was a very, very caring person that always said, you have to consider yourself, your own well-being, but at the same time, never lose sight of the fact that there are other people and, you, you know, people are important in life. And I think because of the nature of our industry, you know, we are, we're storytellers, but at the same time, we're also, we're caring people, or I would say a very, very big percentage of us are. Um, but I think that that is something that I maybe think during the pandemic, through, during lockdown, a lot more people have started to come together a lot more. And all I would say is, you know, let's hope that this doesn't sort of weigh, you know, this disappears once we're out of lockdown. I think it's something that should be maintained and should be kept, you know, everybody should keep that going. That's brilliant. That's such a, such a lovely philosophy that your mother passed on to you there. And it, you know, it's so obvious to me, John, that, you know, all through all your posts and all your support, you give so much to, to care for others. So I would just say thank you for that, first of all. But also yeah. that must be quite time consuming. How much of a commitment is that for you? <laughs> well, I don't know. I kind of seem to, to drift into, into something. And then I always make sure if I've posted something and saying, you know, please post your headshot, your CV. If you're looking for an agent, hashtag seeking representation, mm -hmm. which a lot of people have come forward and done. And it's great to hear people have got agents. Some of people have got agents through doing this. So I will do that. And because I've done that, I think, well, then I do need to then retweet, as I've said. Well, and, and I'm, I'm, again, a great advocate. If I say I'm going to do something, I'll do it. I don't leave it for days and days and days. And if I have to leave something for a period of time, I will always let people know I'm going to be busy doing this because I can't do it as we speak. And I always think that I think people should do that. It's, it's an interesting time, I would imagine, too, because, you know, you've got people who are feeling quite vulnerable and a bit of a desperate situation, wanting to know when I, am I going to work again? Do people care? I'm sort of shouting out into the void. And so yeah. Yeah. it's an interesting balance you have to have with sort of being able to support people, but also going, well, I've, I do have other things to do and it's not personal to you, but I've just got yeah. this moment, you know, where I've got to take something for me. So it, it's a bit of a tricky time, isn't it? In, in terms of it that is. balance. But having said that, if, if somebody does post something out and it's like, you know, I'm at the end of my tether, I'll never work again. You know, uh, mm. in that vein, um, I will look at it and think, you know, I'm not an expert. And, you know, that has to be clear. I'm not an expert in this, you know, but I just see it as well. You know, this person needs some communication. They need to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll even go and I'll put a uh, send them a private message. And usually I'll say, look, I can't really do a lot, but here's my number. If you want to give me a call, you know, I'm not a Samaritan. You know, I don't have all the answers, but and I, I think it's just talking and communicating. Yeah. And it's so important. And I know I don't understand the you know, you know, depression and anxiety. Yes, I get anxiety sometimes, but sometimes, you know, you take yourself away from everything and just think, right, I've got to focus on my, myself and how I'm feeling, my well-being. You know, I will address something, but then I'm thinking, oh God, I've got this to do in a few minutes. And, but what I do is then I'm honest and I'll say, look, I won't be on, on Twitter for, you know, the next hour or a couple of hours. I've got to do a rehearsal. I've got to do this. Please excuse me. And I'll come back to your, your tweets as soon as I possibly can. And then nine times out of ten, I come back and there's loads of them to go through. <laughs> so it's a bit of a, uh, a thing, but that's fine. That's absolutely fine. And, you know, Pete, I am so grateful to everybody that says to me, you know, oh, you're so wonderful. Thank you very much. And, and you know, it's very kind of you to do it. But to me, it's a simple act, you know, and mm. I just don't see it in any other shape or form. You know, I'm, I'm only, I suppose, echoing. It's almost kind of like an image transference, if that makes sense. I try to put myself in somebody else's shoes and it's not always possible. But I think, yeah, I've been there and I've, it's not the last time I've been, I'll go there again. So I try to understand the best way I possibly can how somebody might be feeling in a particular situation. You know, having said that, I don't try to think, analyze how somebody's mind is, the mindset is. If somebody's feeling really depressed, et cetera, et cetera, I can't um, give an answer to that. All I can do is just, lend a listening ear as it were which again you know it's interesting you say that because that's the very nature of our work right so we you know that empathy and putting yourself in someone else's shoes is is very much the job yeah. of us as actors as well so mm -hmm. yeah 
yeah. on that point john let's let's turn a bit more to your acting so you're not just the man behind support british but you are an actor in your own right so tell me how you got started and why you oh, wanted to be God. an actor if you, if you're happy to go back hundreds of years <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> well, actually, I tell you when i first i'm not going to work this out <laughs> God, I I'd say this 40 years ago right but actually john if i can interrupt there i mean for you're anyone happy. watching Mm -hmm. wouldn't that be wonderful for you to be able to say oh 40 years ago when I started acting I think that's a tremendously wonderful thing it's a say. very old saying because there used to be a um and a lot of people don't like them but there used to be a an old time well he was a vaudevillian performer by the name of Danny LaRue and he always used to use this kind of he used to say well I've been in the business for 35 yeah <laughs> Seriously, and that, he used to say all that, you know, uh, but anyway, never no, seriously, for, if I go back and I'm including, um, and I will include the My Amateur Days, which mm. I had a lot of fun doing at the, the age of 18. So I was sort of doing shows in the local church hall and all this kind of stuff. And then in 1983, no, yeah, 1983, God, um, I... Uh, was invited by the British Theatre Association. Uh, we did a, um, a, a week's run of uh, J.B. Priestley play, When We Are Married. I was playing the juvenile lead, so that was, you know. <clears throat> and so we did that at the Hull Truck Theatre, had a fabulous time doing that. And then uh, we jetted off to Austin in Texas and we performed for two weeks uh, to the American people who absolutely loved the play. So we did that. They didn't understand half of the Yorkshire um, <laughs> so things, but they were just laughing at things like balm pot. They didn't know what a balm pot was, but it sounded dreadfully positive. <laughs> they just uh, so that we, we I did that, and so I was still doing amateur stuff. And then I thought, mm, yeah, maybe I could have a crack at doing this. But of course, uh, as a profession, but of course, I don't come from a theatrical family, and it was just a case of well, really, you need to earn money, you need to get a, a job, find to get a trade. I'd done part time work working in a, in a menswear shop and ended up working there full time. So I was earning some money, but there was this thing that was, if you like, eating at me saying, you know, you really want to do something more with this. And I enjoyed telling stories and, you know, getting the feedback of even just doing the amateur stuff. And I will say this for anybody that may be watching this, this interview that, uh, and I'm not saying it in a patronizing way, there are a lot of very, very good amateur actors out there that clearly don't want to take it further. And they're quite happy to be, a very good amateur and and you know i've got total respect for, for these people and having been there myself so uh in 1998 i was accepted at the east 15 acting school it was for me at the time i don't know because well there is always a right time and a wrong time for going to drama school and that wasn't the right time for me so i didn't stay and of course everybody oh you know obviously it's not for you being an actor i knew that it was uh, but it wasn't the right school. It didn't feel right to me. So I took time out and I went back to, to Hull in East Yorkshire, where I, I was born and bred, and took up a full-time job in a, a department store. So I did that for 18 months. Brilliant for character building. So some wonderful, interesting people wandering around. So I did that. And I knew I really don't want to do this. I've got to get to, I've got to pursue this. And I know that drama school isn't necessarily the way forward in this business and, and and if people can carve a career in it without having to go to drama school then absolutely brilliant but it's horses for courses and it's it's a choice you get a good I got a good grounding and I was accepted at the Birmingham School of Speech and Drama or in its its heyday it was the Birmingham School of Speech Training and Dramatic Art try saying that after a few whiskies <laughs> uh, and so then it's now the Birmingham Conservatoire so I mean that, that was that's quite recent. So I did my three years training and I will say for anybody coming into the business, um, again, I think with drama school, I found it quite, there was a lot of drilling, shall we say, you were, you, you, you a lot of repetition. And there are things that, you know, you like, you don't like. It's like you bite the apple and you spit out the bits you don't like. Mm. And that's it. anybody wanting to go into this business, take what is good for you, listen to everybody, learn from everyone, uh, but be your own person. Don't try to be anybody else. Sage advice. That's fabulous. I totally oh, agree with that. Drama school came, went. I was a bit of a late starter. So that took me to 1993. There's that sudden void. You come out of drama school, safe environment, 
oh my god what am i going to do yeah. you know I, I, you know you kind of almost expect hope you're going to hit the big time and get something forget it it doesn't work like that unless you're very very you know it is luck there's a lottery what did i do i need to be near london not not to say that that is the place to be you know you could want to be a northern actor maybe you know base yourself in manchester or somewhere mm -hmm. like that um like you have explained to me you've lived from over in various different places i did I, i'd lived in manchester i lived in leeds um god where else uh, in hull uh, and surrey and then back to london but when i was in surrey and i stayed with a friend in in uh, woking i was only supposed to stay for three weeks i ended up staying for three years <laughs> but it was a base and oh. um, so uh, you know work involvement in the industry so I, I know what i'll do let's see if there's any um uh you know work backstage or something so i worked as a dresser and i will never ever say anybody wants to do it uh yes you might be what is deemed as the lower end of the pecking order i didn't see it like that it was a good way of contact and it's great because you are watching a show and you're learning a routine you're learning how a show starts if you can get into a show right from the beginning you're seeing how the director works etc etc you see how the whole thing starts um a lot harder of course if you join a, a long running show like les mis or, or phantom or something like that because obviously that's been going for 30 years so you're mm -hmm. kind of jumping into something yes new casts but it's still quite daunting so i i, I did that on and off I had to change agents because the one i was with at the time there was nothing no communication again that's that's something i hate people not keeping in touch so uh gosh i moved on did various bits and pieces quite a lot of theater stuff and then um i was very lucky because i funnily enough as i mentioned working as a dresser i was working as a dresser at the national theater uh, on the south bank and um a notice went up they were looking for uh people um speaking ensemble uh for an enemy of the people i'm gonna go for that so i did and i was cast in it so that was great uh, but i continued doing um working as a dresser there as well which was uh, an interesting uh, combination you know the block of six on the play i was in and then coming back the next day to to start uh, assisting actors with costumes yeah. But do you know something it gives a lot of respect you get a lot of respect and 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 there's you know because you learn you know um people that come into the industry that don't want to be actors but want to work in a theater on one particular occasion an actor that was just standing there and i'm talking should have known better and just looked at me and went straight on and afterwards and said do you mind not talking to me at this point at that point of the show and i said well i was only being friendly <laughs> No, please don't, because I'm thinking what I've got to do when I get on stage. I've got to remember, I've got to pick a tray up and put it over there and put that, you know. So you learn. And mm -hmm. uh, anybody that goes into the business and wants to just uh, work in the industry doing that, you know, you've got, it's something that you learn. You know, there are times when to be quiet and times when to talk. So, yeah, I did that. And then um, in 1998, I moved over to Berlin to live there for two years. I'm going to get a job here. So uh, again, there was nothing acting wise because of the language. There, the, the, there is a, a, an English speaking theatre in Berlin. Uh, I got an agent whilst I was over there. Bagged myself a couple of little telly jobs, which was quite good. But luckily they wanted the actor speaking English. So I didn't speak fluent but, uh, German. Uh, but then I got a job working on a fabulous production again. But again, it was costume department. Um, Der Glockner von Notre Dame. Now, if you can work that translation out, it's pretty straightforward. Glocken is bells. Um, the mm -hmm. bell ringer of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't call it because in, in Germany, um, they don't use the word hunchback okay. because it's an yes. insult to somebody's deformity, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's the bell ringer of Notre Dame, and it was a twenty-three million pound production, Walt Disney, mm -hmm. and that was back in 1998, 1999. I had a fantastic time, eighteen hundred seat theatre, working with you know James Lapine, um, and it was a predominantly uh, American cast. Uh, they came over from New York, and it forced me into learning uh, more German. I don't speak fluent German, but I learned a lot whilst I was over there, so that was that was quite good. And then after the two years I've been in Berlin, I thought, no, sorry, I've had enough. I've got to come back. So I was back in 2000, went back to Hull, worked at um, one of the uh, local cinemas. So another kind of 
extension of the entertainment industry in, in, in a way. Uh, did that move to Leeds about 2003 or 2004? Again, working in a cinema, just thinking back to what I did. Uh, and then uh, it came to 2005, six, and I thought, no, I don't want to be here. I'm going to go back, set back down to London, and this is where I've been ever since. So I had a great time, and that's it, really, and where we are where we're at at the moment. And, and obviously, during this, this horrible time that everybody's going through, uh, I'm trying to be as proactive and as kind of keeping the mind occupied, and came upon this idea of doing rehearsed readings. Um, you know, people have really received them well, and... You know, it's giving a company of actors, including myself, something to do. And on top of that, we're raising funds to help a worthy cause, which is, of course, acting for others. But they are an umbrella charity for 14 different industry related charities. Mm -hmm. So we're raising money and it's ongoing. So um, and we're doing Twelfth Night at the end of March and then we're doing The Importance of Being Earnest in May. So that's that's all in the bag. They're all cast. I've uh, got everybody. And then hopefully, fingers crossed in June, um, I'll be doing a two-hander with someone. Who knows what will happen after that? Things hopefully will change. And, you know, it's not that we don't want to do rehearsed readings, but it's it's something I think that's that's um, giving people something to do and, 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 you know, keeping the old brain cells going. That's fantastic, John. And I think your story about the journey really does illustrate it really is a marathon and not a sprint, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you've committed to being a long hauler and then sometimes that's meant moving to other places and then maybe doing a job that's adjacent to acting or not directly yeah. acting for a while, but then you keep coming back and doing things. And I think that's yeah. really inspiring for people to hear and to mm -hmm. understand that it's not always that kind of trajectory. It's it can be a little bit sort yeah. of squiggly and, and yeah, roller coaster. Uh, yeah, yeah. But you've you're going slowly and then you might go up. And, you know, I think it's more emphatic now because, you know, people are just not getting you know, because there's auditions and yes, things are gradually coming in now. And of course, we look at our Twitters and I do it. You look, you think, why is it that they're getting? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Why are they? Getting, mm -hmm. I'm not a human. It's human nature to think that way. But it, it's it's all the more emphasised now, now than mm. normal circumstances. Yeah. Yes, we've got to focus on our own careers, but people do need to really kind of say, OK, somebody needs a bit of help here. Somebody let's collaborate. Let's, uh, you know, and do something together. You can do things that don't cost money. I mean, I have total respect for, for people saying, you know, I can do your showreel for X, Y, Z. I can do this for you. I can do that. I can help you um, create this. It all costs money. And yes, it's a it's a vicious circle. People need to earn money. But yeah. what I think is important is if people can't afford to do these things nobody but nobody should feel that they are left out as much as we do i need to have some modern headshots well they don't come up you know they're not cheap yeah well nobody says they expect somebody to work for nothing in view of the the, the current situation and, and no work um that a majority of people you know, nobody's getting you know uh, if people are then putting things out saying oh you need to have more headshots it's it's a catch-22 situation you need the work mm -hmm to pay for the headshots, but because you haven't got the work, you can't have the headshots done. So as long as people, industry people, that are saying, you know, you do need to have more headshots done. Yes, it's fully understandable. We don't have money. We can't always go to the bank of mummy and daddy to, to, to pay for it. I can't, mm -hmm. I don't have parents anymore, but you know, and they have helped me in the past just to set the cards straight, sure. but uh, these things have to be accepted. And yes, go out and get another job, get something to, to pay for that. If people can do it, but, there aren't the jobs out there mm -hmm. and you know so it's a very very difficult situation and well I'm not that politically minded but I really and truthfully do think that you know our governments if I may just say so sure. uh, have really fallen short on this and they mm -hmm. should have been looking at all of this well in advance and this isn't just for people in the acting community it's mm -hmm. it's everybody they should have looked at all of this uh, a heck of a long time ago, they mm -hmm. didn't. I don't think we would have been in as bad a situation uh, as we are in now. Yeah, it's, it's going to be very interesting, I think, John, when this all sort of comes to whatever conclusion it may draw to yeah. and when that's going to happen. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I've certainly thought a lot about, you know, government responsibility, individual responsibility, the way yeah. we're going to think about our finances you know, upon reflection of this situation and the way we're going to think about public health and personal health. And I think yeah. that's all going to require 
a significant amount of review if it hasn't yeah. already begun to happen. Yeah, take for example, without giving names, um, <laughs> the, the culture secretary, and if he happens to be watching this, he'll know what I'm, what I'm talking about. When uh, they said, oh, we could open our doors again, I think it was, it was put out on a Thursday or something. You can open your doors again on Saturday, as if we can just open our theatre doors and just carry on, pick up from where we left off. It doesn't yeah. work like that. Rehearsals, as you know, have got to be, we've got to rehearse, re-rehearse something, maybe recast something because mm -hmm. somebody doesn't want to come back or, or they've got something else. So our industry doesn't work like that. And it's cost thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. And, yeah. and, and you know, I think our industry has been, yes, there was 1.57 billion that was dished out, as it were, but that's not all free. That has to be paid back quite a bit of it. But mm. a lot of the bigger establishments are getting it. And it's all the smaller companies mm -hmm. who have always struggled on the periphery, you know, uh, fringe and smaller companies. Yes. And there are companies that are going to shut the doors and never, ever come back again. Mm. What do these people do? Yeah. Go and find another profession, as, as, as the Chancellor said. You know, I mean, you know, learn the industry. You don't have to be in it. Learn how the industry works. You know, get to a bit of research because these very people will come to the theatre and they will come to the opening night. They will sit there. They will drink the best champagne. They will eat all the, the best finery of food that's been put on for them. And they'll sit there in the box or whatever and enjoy the evening and say how wonderful it was and all the rest of it. But do they ever stop to think of the hard work? Do they ever stop mm. to think of on in to make this this mm. evening what it is you know and these very same people will be coming back to the theater and i spotted somebody put a post up and said on twitter and said would you as a producer or a director or whatever invite any of these people to your 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 premiere um and there were certain of a, a mixture of answers i'll say that it's fascinating to me john being someone australian born i mean obviously i've lived in the uk um and will be again but I, I do remember even prior to my first trip ever to London as a, yeah. as a slightly younger lady um seeing some London theatre was such a priority for me because you know you go West End London you know the usual tourist spots of what London represents but theatre yeah. is like a big part of that it's a big character even yes. across the UK as I started to learn and you know yeah. your different fringe festivals and your pantomime yeah. culture and all that stuff is yes. so it's such a huge industry and money maker and and mm -hmm. you know the fact that we were chatting about this before that you can go to a show and go oh my god there's sir ian mckellen's walking past yeah. me and yes. as king lear and go wow like how yeah. cool is that you know yeah. so it was yeah. very heartbreaking for me watching from the outside going what are they doing this is a this is a big industry a lot of people come to london to see Yes, Theater, yeah. you know, with the economy and it's in the millions. And I wish I, I could remember the the um, what the, the figure is, but it goes into the millions that, that, that our industry pours into the economy. Wow. And, and I mean, not only uh, are the theatres affected, but think of the businesses like, for example, in the mm. West End, you know, you, 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 you must have walked past, you know, uh, restaurants and things and yes it's oh, yeah. very touristy and it'll say theatre deal you know yeah. you get a meal and yeah. it's and, and so all those businesses they're all closed if the theatres are open it's bringing new remuneration into all these uh, industries that are, are, are around and as I say it's not it isn't just the West End you know it's all over the country mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, revenue uh, makers for theatre on the profit is pantomime Mm -hmm. oh yeah you know, fingers crossed it's, it'll be back this year I haven't done mm -hmm. one for a long time if anybody's mm -hmm. watching this I am available to play villain um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes I make a good villain but I am a nice person really I mm hope -hmm. uh, but yeah so you know um, Panto is and it's a very important aspect of, of, mm. of the industry I think but that makes a lot of money and, and it makes a lot of money for that theatre you do get the you know the producers um big producers that will uh have a that, that maybe have say six or eight pantomimes in various theaters around the country mm. obviously that particular theater that they're going to say for example hull new theater or the birmingham hippodrome um darlington civic any of the 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 um bigger theaters that is how these theaters make their money 
um, sometimes because they don't always have a lot going on during the, the, the year and, and mm -hmm. they can't always afford to have these shows in. So you get the one nighters with comedians and, you know, which is brilliant, but it, it's, it's not making enough. So if they get a panto and they get, you know, some relatively familiar faces in the panto for say four or five weeks, it's, you know, it puts a lot of revenue into that theater. And, yeah. you know, this has got to come back not just Panto, the entire industry, it has yeah. to come. Yeah. It's going to take time, we know that, but, you know, without being too overly optimistic about it, mm. I think we have to maintain some kind of a of an opti optimism to say that this will this will happen. You know, we're I agree, in, John. Yeah. As one of my drama school tutors said to me many, many years ago, and I've never forgotten this, he said, what you've got to remember he said is this is an industry not a hobbit walking party and i'll never forget that but it's so true you know <laughs> it's jolly and ah, it's a business you know and it is a business, uh, mm -hmm. it is a business you know but I, I, this there's something that um a friend of mine i haven't seen for again another one i haven't seen for a very very long time i'm not going to name this person it's just somebody very very well known mm -hmm. said and this person has said it before and they said it to me, you know, take yourself, don't take yourself seriously, but take your job seriously. Now then, there's a lot of fun to be had in this business. You know, mm. I'm not sort of trying to be all Walt Disney, but sure. there's a lot of fun to be in, had in the business. And I think, you know, if you walk into somewhere, into an audition or into a re well, audition or a rehearsal room, you know, uh, yeah, somebody might be like, oh, God, I can't remember my lines and I've got a dreadful headache and I just want to be quiet. That's mm -hmm. fine. But, you know, we're there to enjoy ourselves. We're there mm -hmm. to do a job. Let's enjoy it, because otherwise, why do it? And, yeah. you know, um, that's also, I know I'm sort of digressing on a little bit, but I, I do think that, you know, this is this is something that is really, really important. And I think people really need to think about these these things as well, especially for people that are wanting to come into the industry you know it's not easy it's not an easy business um and you know hard work does pay off uh but i would say that there is a lot of luck you know yes work hard and you know work hard play hard or as my aunt used to say work a bit play a bit <clears throat> so john your pearls of wisdom have just been fantastic and i think they're much needed right now especially for you know, younger or much up and coming, more up and coming actors who are getting quite caught up at the moment. And, and rightly so, I understand that mm. in what future is there for them and how do, mm. I, how do I get my break and why won't people respond to my emails? I think it's so important that you, you've kind of brought it back to enjoy what you do because mm. if it's stressful. And there were times, you know, I was getting way too stressed and way mm. too caught up in you know I've got to get them to love me at the audition and I have to get this job and it's life and death and you know and I was melting down and hence why I ended up you know training as a as a hypnotherapist in order to improve that in myself and, and that in others so um, yeah. Thank you for reminding us of these things that we often forget. Well, I, ju I just think, you know, um, it's it's kind of, I think, I guess it comes to sort of being you know, self-awareness and, and, and mm. I always say never be frightened to ask questions. Love that. Love that. Never be frightened to ask questions. People, yeah. you know, a um, little example, if, if I may share Please. it, that yeah. is, I remember kind of Curb, curbed myself a lot on it now but mm -hmm. you know going into the rehearsal room and, and you'll get this what I call a very very academic director and they'll use big words what I call big words might not be big words to other people but they'll say something and they're asking you to do something a certain way with your character so you're standing there and I've done it and you're standing there and you're nodding your head thinking I don't really understand what he's talking about but I'll nod my head because everybody else is looking and probably yeah. understanding what he's saying or she's saying so then when it comes to deliver what they want you to do, you don't carry it out. So the director mm. says, you never carried out. So anything I don't understand, any single word, <clears throat> yes, I can look it up, but if it's in the middle of a, a, a conversation, I will say to somebody, you know, what, sorry, I, I've heard that word before, but what does it mean? So the point I'm making is if you're not sure about something, however simple it may seem to other people, you might think, oh God, I don't understand this. It's a big thing to me. It's not. It, mm -hmm. it might be, I should say, but it's 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 that you need to ask. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, there's times I didn't ask either and I was very intimidated. But I think a lot of that, John, is 
we worry so much about, oh, they're going to think I'm an idiot or, oh, you know, I'm going to get in trouble by the director. But no, you're absolutely right because ultimately they, you're there to deliver something. And if you yeah. haven't understood what it is, then that's mm. going to create more issues. I think if you get somebody that, that you know, uh, says you should know that, then they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. You know, it's, you've got to, and, uh, you know, a director, uh, I would say, Virtually all the directors I've I've worked with <clears throat> are very good managers, and they've got to be able to manage people. Mm -hmm. uh, very understanding and and you know, but just on that odd occasion, you know, you go, oh God, well you, I told you something, so you know, speak up, ask questions. Yeah. Absolutely. And that, that, and it's that we're learning all the time in this industry. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what age you are. You know, you might have that little bit, you know, a good few more years experience than somebody else, but it's that you know you come on something you come to something else somebody else might know about that you don't even you know my old my ripe old age I'm, i shouldn't say that because some people are going to go well i'm older than you but <laughs> um, i just think that you know i i now if, if i'm not sure some about something at an appropriate point or when i feel it's right i will question it in the nicest way possible and just say well i'm not sure what you mean could you be a little bit more explicit can you just explain that even if it's in baby language i don't care mm -hmm. so that i get and i get that and because then you've got the information and you can do what you've you've been requested to do fantastic well john this has been utterly delightful and i could keep talking to you for hours but we better wrap up there so okay. how about um if you can tell everybody where they can find you a bit more about your rehearsed readings yeah You've got the floor uh, Go for okay it. well if you uh want to follow the accounts i'd love to have you on board um you need to go onto twitter and the twitter handle the name is at support british all one word capital s and a capital b all one word at support british and uh it's run by myself john craggs and my twitter handle is at john craggs actor uh also um on the 28th of March, I'm going to be uh, well, I'm producing, I'm going to be in it as well, um, a production, um, Shakespeare production, the 12th night, or what you will, that'll be on the 28th, and it'll be live streamed uh, on YouTube, and it's to raise funds for Acting for Others charity, uh, which is um, an umbrella of 14 different charities. So uh, if you want to watch that, there will be a link I'll be posting up uh, for the live stream. That will go up two or three days before. Uh, it's a Sunday, by the way, Sunday the 28th. So you'll be able to click on that. And uh, we don't charge for people to watch the rehearsed readings. But if you can possibly afford a couple of pounds, three pounds or five, uh, whatever you feel is within your pocket um, is, is affordable, it would be absolutely amazing. And then uh, on the 2nd of May, we're going to be doing um, Oscar Wilde's uh, The Importance of Being Earnest. We had a brilliant cast lined up for that. And then hopefully we'll see what the future lies. And I hope the future for everybody is, is going to be, you know, we'll move forward with this. We are a collective. We are a collaboration of, of, of um, supportive uh, creatives, whether you're an actor, uh, whether you're in stage management, whether you're a director, a casting director, a producer, whichever area, we're all part of a team, whether it's television, theatre, film, uh, we're all together. So let's continue. And my, my I'm a big advocate for support. So please do it. Oh, John, I think we'll end on that note. Thank you so much for your time and letting us Thank know you. a little bit about your story because you're so supportive of other people. It's nice to see the man behind the, the support Absolutely. British. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very Fantastic. much. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this. And if you'd like to see more videos in this series, please remember to subscribe to Why This.